All right, guys, I just wanna make sure that we are going to stay on track as far as our calendars goes um, because this unit has so much content. It's important that we don't get behind. Um, and so we're just gonna do uh, this lovely video recording uh, to fill in the, the time we didn't have to get through everything today. So I did back up a little bit just because it's the same idea, same um, thought, and I wanna make sure it's a complete thought so I don't break it up in the middle. So we're gonna start with this idea of colonies. Um, once a government uh, feels strong enough, feels like their, their hub is secure, that they've got power and control and laws and wealth, et cetera, um, then they start to look outside of themselves to increase all of that, the power, the wealth, um, the influence, all of that. And they do so through this idea of colonialism, okay? The, the um, definition of colonialism is the effort by one country to establish settlements and impose its political, economic, and cultural principles on a territory, okay? Um, so you've got this home country that goes and um, takes over other areas of the world. It establishes a colony. A colony is a territory that's legally tied to a sovereign state rather than being independent, okay? Uh, rather than being independent. Um, it's usually sparsely populated before the colony is established, but not always. Um, and sparsely populated is kind of a subjective term. Um, anytime you have an indigenous people uh, occupying a land before it's colonized, it turns into imperialism. And we're going to talk about that next. Okay. Um, the, <laughs> the map that's on this page, just an interesting, funny kind of map. These are the countries that Britain did not invade. Okay. Every other country that's in kind of that dark blue color, Britain invaded. The ones that are yellow are the only countries in the world that Britain did not invade at one point or another, which is, you know, not very, not very many. All right, slide. So European colonialism specifically. The Europeans created colonies for those three G reasons, okay, that you talk about in Miss Nay's class that we talk about as well. God to promote Christianity, gold to gain valuable resources, and glory to show their relative power and to increase that relative power. The Europeans first started colonizing in the late 1400s, and they started with the Americas. Um, most of those colonies in North and South America had declared independence by 1824. And so at that point, Europe turned their attention and their sights on co um, colonizing Africa and Asian countries or territories. Now, that brings us to this idea of imperialism. Imperialism is the control of a territory that was already occupied and organized by an indigenous society. So there were already people there who had already set up their own versions of government that already had a claim on the land, that already had a historical and, and cultural tradition tied to that land, and Europeans came in and took over anyway, okay? Often violent, uh, but not always. And even if it didn't start violent, it often becomes violent. Um, as more Europeans show up, as they want to spread further. Um, <clears throat> the UK created the largest colonial empire. The sun never set on the British Empire. France also had a large empire with colonies concentrated in West Africa and Southeast Asia. And as I said in class, and I will say again now, um, the British and the French had a very different way of governing their colonies. Um, and so we're going to look a little bit deeper into what those differences were uh, in just a minute. Right, next up. So this is the British Empire at its height. Um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Okay. This tiny little area of land right up here ends up controlling and influencing um, territories all across the globe. Okay, from the furthest south point is probably either the Falkland Islands or the southern areas of New Zealand and the northern parts of Canada. Okay, 
all the way north and south, all the way east and west. Um, truly, it's not just a saying, but truly the sun never set on the uh, empire of Great Britain. Um, still, um, you'll see right here this idea of dominions. These are areas that still have very um, close ties to Great Britain still today. Um, New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and Canada still have very close ties. Okay. Um, okay, so this is what the world looks like, how it was split up before um, World War I. Okay, at the very inception of World War I, this is what it looks like. Um, all of the different colors represent different governments in control. Okay, so you'll notice here we have France, and then down here, lots of French territories. Okay, French, French, um, French over here in Southeast Asia. That's Vietnam and Laos, Cambodia. Um, you'll notice this is British, that kind of mauve pink color. British, 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 everywhere, okay? Lots and lots of influence because these are all colonies of these European countries. Um, you'll also notice up here we have Russia and then we have more territory that Russia is controlling. Um, this down here is British. This right here is Portugal. So we have Portugal here, Portugal here, okay? So it gives you a really good sense as to how far these colonies had expanded in the early 1900s. So most, um, before World War I, most African and Asian territory was controlled by British, or not British, European colonies, okay? Um, but most of those African and Asian colonies become independent after World War II. There's only a handful of colonies that still exist. Most of them tend to be islands in the Caribbean, okay, um, or in Southeast Asia, over here, um, like the South Pacific area. The most populous of the colonies that still exist is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is still technically a colony of the United States. Um, there has been some call for Puerto Rico to become a state um, within the United States, it would be the 51st state, but that hasn't gained a whole lot of traction. Um, and so currently they're still considered just a colony. Back 1914, okay, all of the colonies worldwide. This is 2008, colonies that still exist. Okay, so if we go back and here 2008, less than 100 years later, the colonies had basically dwindled almost to zero. We still have French Guiana here, which is a colony in, of France, obviously. <laughs> um, it's hard to see because it's so little, but there's lots of colonies here in the Caribbean. Uh, there's also some British colony or some French colonies over here in Southeast Asia, um, South Pacific as well. Um, but really, for the most part, all of the colonies are basically gone almost. Rewind. So we talked about the differences between the French and the British in governing their colonies. Um, it's almost two separate, completely different models. So the French specifically, they attempted to assimilate their colonies into French culture. Um, they wanted the people of their colonies to be French. Um, and so what they did is they educated an elite group of locals, the people who lived there before, the indigenous population, um, to provide local leadership, and they educated them in French ways, French government, French uh, culture, French food, French style, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and as a result, even after those colonies become independent, they still have very, very close ties to France. Um, and by close ties, I mean things like alliances and treaties, um, trade, re you know, trade agreements between the countries, um, stuff like that. Very close, very good terms, okay, with the French. Um, the British, on the other side, um, did something very different. 
they created different government policies in each of its colonies, okay? Different government poli policies in each colony. Um, they often allowed the local inhabitants to maintain their diverse cultures and their local customs. And the British colonies um, made peaceful transitions to independence in most cases. Now, <laughs> there are certainly examples, obviously the United States being one of them, where the transition from British colony to independent nation or independent state is very different. Um, it's not peaceful. <laughs> um, we fought a revolutionary war that lasted six years as a result. Um, it, it was not, it was not a peaceful transition of power, but most of the British colonies, um, transitioning from colony to independent state, it, it, it was peaceful. Um, however, the difference is that those colonies don't necessarily still have close ties to the British. Um, the French, because they really sought to envelop them in everything French, even after independence, they still feel ties to France. The British less so because they allowed their colonies to maintain their own local diversity, their own local customs and culture and traditions. Um, once they become independent, they really don't have the same amounts of um, pull toward the British as the French colonies did, if that makes sense. Um, very different ways of doing things. Um, pros and cons to both. There isn't, you know, this one was better than this one because there's pros and cons to both. Um, it is certainly admirable that even after the French colonies um, maintain or became independent that they still had these close ties to France. That's certainly a good thing, especially for the French and also for the colonies too because they still have a powerful ally. Um, however, how much local culture, how much diversity, how much uniqueness to those nations was lost because they gave it up to become French. Um, whereas the opposite for the British, right? Those people maintained their cultural traditions and their um, uniqueness and their diversity, but didn't necessarily maintain those close ties to Britain. So it really just depends on how you look at it, what's better, what's worse, um, pros and cons for both. Okay, Yugoslavia. We, you got a little bit of a, an intro to Yugoslavia when we watched the Once Brothers movie. Um, really good um, introduction to the idea of the issues that formed Yugoslavia and then what kind of did it in. Um, so <laughs> Yugoslavia is one of those countries and one of those stories that you guys really need to know. Um, because just like I said with North, North and South Korea, it's a really good example of a lot of different elements that come into play um, when we talk in terms of human geography, okay? So Yugoslavia is located in the Balkans. Um, the Balkans is a region in Southeastern Europe um, named for the Balkan mountains that are there. The region itself is about the size of Texas. Okay, so it's fairly large. Um, the region includes the following countries currently. Okay, um, so we've got Albania, we've got Bulgaria, we've got Greece, we've got Romania, and then we've got countries that formerly comprised Yugoslavia and are now independent or seeking independence. And those countries include places like Serbia and Croatia. Um, Bosnia, it's actually Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is kind of a tricky way to say it. Um, Kosovo's in there and some others. Um, there were six, I believe, six different nations within the borders of the state of Yugoslavia, okay? really what it boils down to, it was, it was a complex assemblage of ethnicities that are found in the Balkans. Okay. These all are different ethnicities than these. Okay. So we've got a fairly compact area. It's large territory, but in terms of all of the different nations that are included in it, it's not super large. Um, and so when we talk about this particular area, having so many different ethnic groups, um, 
it has long been a region for hotbed um, conflict, specifically ethnic conflict. Um, we saw it happen in World War One. We see it happen again in World War Two. Um, we try to fix it after World War II and really just set it up for a whole different version of civil war in the 90s. Um, so, right? Happens in this region called the Balkans. Okay? It's named after a specific mountain range called the Balkans. Moving on. Post-World War I, the Allies created the new country of Yugoslavia. Okay? We said, here, <laughs> let's just take all of you guys because you're regionally, um, geographically close and put you all together into one country. Um, the prime minister um, and the president, same guy, his name was Josip Broz Tito. And Tito was instrumental. In, I can't highlight instrumental enough, um, but like super instrumental in creating a Yugoslavian nationality, okay? So you aren't Croatian, you aren't Serbian, you aren't um, Kosovoian. I don't know what that is. Kosovite, probably. Um, you are Yugoslavian. And when we watch the movie Once Brothers, you see that um, Vlade Divac really adopted that. He felt Yugoslavian. He wasn't Serbian, even though he ethnically was. He wanted to be Yugoslavian. Um, we see similar efforts in the United States. I'm not Danish, even though my ethnicity is Danish. I'm American, okay? I'm from the United States of America. Um, and so the idea was that we were going, Tito's idea was that he was going to unite all of these different ethnic groups under one umbrella of Yugoslavian, okay? He accepted the ethnic diversity. Oh, let me change my pen. He accepted the ethnic diversity um, that existed both in religion and language. Um, the five most numerous ethnicities you're going to find, Croat or Croatian, Macedonian, Montenegrin, Serbian, and Slovenian. Um, and he allowed them to basically have some control. Okay, so this, this is where we get into that idea of semi-autonomous. autonomous okay um he had he allowed them to have some control so they he accepted the diversity he accepted the difference in language and religion um he accepted the different ethnic traditions and he um gave them control and it says con considerable control so that's probably um more towards almost autonomous right over the areas that they inhabited now Everything was great. And when you talk, when we watch the movie, Once, Once Brothers, Vlade Divac talks about how he only knew peace. His whole upbringing was peaceful. His country had been at peace for, for decades. Um, everyone was getting along. Yugoslavia was thriving, not just economically, but nationally. Okay, People really bought into this idea of Yugoslavia as that's who I am, as an identity. Um, however, Tito dies. Because everything that he set up, he sort of was the spearhead of it. And when he dies, things start to fall apart. Because the people who take over after he dies don't govern in the same way that he did. And don't push the same things that he pushed. And so as a result of his death, we have countries dissolving into ethnic conflicts. Or areas within the country dissolving into these ethnic conflicts. Um... The, the biggest one was the difference between the Serbs and the Croats, um, which we saw play out in Once Brothers, right? Between um, Vladi Divac and, um, oh my gosh, I forgot his name, Raja um, Drazen Petrovic. So ultimately what ends up happening through an awful lot of conflict, through an awful lot of ethnic cleansing and genocide and violence and bombs and war, just awful things, okay? We end up with seven smaller countries whose boundaries do not match, by the way, do not match ethnic occupation. So the breakup isn't peaceful. Um, it could have been peaceful 
if they had said, okay, the Croats live here, so this is the area that they get. The Serbians live here, this is the area that they get. The Bosnians live here, this is the area that they get. But that isn't the way that it happened <laughs> because people always want more, right? When we talk about um, political power and political conflict, they're always looking for more. More territory equals more power, so we want more. Um, and so the seven smaller countries that get broken up the boundaries don't match the ethnic occupation. It's not a nation state that they establish, even though they could have. Um, but as a result, the breakup's not peaceful. Ethnic conflict is experienced in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Croatia, Serbia too. Um, but yeah, just all kinds of awful things happen in the 90s in Yugoslavia, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, that happens in Yugoslavia. And that leads to this idea of balkanization. Now, <laughs> it is no um, accident that every, um, but everything that we see play out in Yugoslavia in the 90s leads us to this new term, this very new vocabulary word um, of balkanization. And the idea of balkanization is that... Um, It's the process, okay, so the definition, we'll start there. The process by which a state breaks down through conflicts among its ethnicities, okay? So anytime where you see um, many, many nations within one country, within one state, you have the potential for balkanization. And what happens in Yugoslavia is it becomes balkanized. It's a small geographic area that could not successfully be organized into stable countries because it was inhabited by many ethnicities with complex long-standing antagonisms toward each other. And so we see Yugoslavia, while Tito was alive, it's peaceful. The people buy into what he's selling. They want peace. They want to get along. But as soon as he dies, everything basically died with him, and it just dissolves into this um, mess of ethnic conflict. Um, so Yugoslavia, if you happen to be asked ever for an example of balkanization, Yugoslavia, while it certainly isn't the only example, it is probably the best example. Because really what happens in Yugoslavia is what births this concept, okay? It is the, the origin story of this um, term. So Yugoslavian balkanization basically go hand in hand. Okay. Let me, let me just, we're going to take a little bit of a turn. We've talked about imperialism. Okay. Um, before and how, when Europe first started colonizing, they looked to the Americas, North and South America. And then after, um, the North and South American colonies become independent, they, they set their sights on Africa and Southeast Asia. We're going to talk specifically about um, now Africa, um, specifically what Europe decides for Africa. Now, before we get into this specifically, let me give you some context. Africa at this point in time, okay, we're talking the eight, late 1800s, 1884 to 1885 is when the Berlin Conference happens. Um, the between about probably early 1800s to this 1884 to 1885, what had been happening was Europe had been colonizing Africa, okay? Um, this was a period of colonialism. Um, of European colonialism, specifically. Um, however, when the Europeans show up in Africa, what they find is people are already there. <laughs> Lots of people are already there. They are set up in tribes, okay? Um, they do things very, very differently, okay? They have a different government structure. They have a different education structure. Um, they have um, different cultural uh, traditions. They have different religious rituals and um, 
sets of character and morality pieces, right? Very, very different. Africa as a continent is different in lots of ways. Um, physical geography obviously is very different. We're talking rainforest, we're talking desert, we're talking very dry areas. Um, so that by itself is pretty much opposite of what we find in Europe. And so um, as a result, the tribes that lived in Africa at this time, you know, they adjusted and, and lived their life in ways that the Europeans who came in later and observed and took over saw as very primitive. Um, again, it's, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like your opinion because what it, what was working in Africa had been working in Africa for centuries and the Europeans come in and see it as something that they think is primitive, something that they think is, you know, outdated or, or not effective. And so they come in and it becomes very imperialism. Okay. Very much imperialistic because the European colonists who show up take over and in some ways take over very violently from the indigenous tribes that lived there originally. Um, and so when we look to the early 1800s to this 1884, 1885 Berlin conference, what we see is basically um, unchecked colonialism and imperialism of Africa by almost every European nation. Okay. They showed up, they took over, they knew that there were all kinds of resources there, different resources than what you find in Europe because of the different climate and the different topography. Um, and so people wanted it. They also see the African tribes, the various tribes as being very hardworking, um, very strong, very gifted um, physically. And unfortunately, <laughs> that opens them up to being taken over and used in slave trades, um, which obviously had been going on long before this. Um, so what happens in 1884 and 1885 is representatives from the major empires in Europe and also the United States, mind you, the United States is part of this, met in Berlin, okay, this was in Germany, to lay out claims made for the continent of Africa. Now notice, the people who sit down at this table are from Europe and the US. There isn't anyone actually from Africa who is invited, okay? The European powers and the United States sit down and decide how to divvy up the continent of Africa. Okay. These claims were made to form the state boundaries of Africa. So what we see today as being country boundaries were put in place by European imperialists and the United States um, in the 1800s, the late 1800s. These boundaries showed little regard to the existing ethno-linguistic, cultural, and political boundaries that were already in place by the native Africans, okay? As a result, one colony might include a patchwork of rival cultural groups, and one cultural group might be divided up into multiple colonies. And so essentially what happens is you have the Europeans and the Americans coming in and saying, this is what we see as, Af as Africa, Okay, here's this land, here's this territory. This part goes to the British. Let's, di let's divide up the countries. Okay, let's divide up the colonies. These ones go to the Portuguese. These ones go to the British. These ones go to the French. Okay, but they did not pay attention at all, nor did they consult at all the people who were already in Africa. Um, and so, unfortunately... A lot of the conflict that comes later on the continent of Africa starts here because had the Europeans and the Americans simply talked to the various tribes that were going to be influenced and affected by this, they probably would have made some better decisions as to how things should be broken up. Um, so this is what we get. And I apologize that that graphic is not super clear. But what you see on the left is basically the tribal boundaries of African tribes originally in Africa. Okay. 
lots and lots of little ones, right? Lots of, um, basically like the African version of a city state, right? Where here's our central settlement, here's the surrounding territory that we claim for hunting and for agriculture. Um, and there's lots of them, okay? Different languages, different cultural traditions, different religions. Um, and then what we see on the left, or on the right, sorry, so that's this one, the original tribal boundaries. What we see in this one on the right is the tribal boundaries underneath with the overlay of the actual borders that the British, or not the British, that the Europeans and the Americans put into place. So you see lots and lots and lots of tribes, some friendly, some not friendly, different languages, different cultures, different um, backgrounds, different goals, all put into one country. Which when you're talking about it being a colony of a European country, really isn't that big of a deal because the colony is in charge, right? The British are in charge or the French are in charge. Um, but when all of these countries become independent, when they kick out the British or they kick out the French or whoever, now all of a sudden we have the country of Nigeria, which is right here, with all of these different groups, like dozens of them, maybe even hundreds of them, who don't necessarily get along, who don't necessarily want the same things. Sorry, this is Nigeria, like right there. <laughs> um, and now all of a sudden they have to figure out how to govern and how to get along. And it is not something that they do well, and it is not something that they do peacefully. And that is that story is played out in pretty much every single African country on the entire continent, trying to figure out how to get along with people that you have never gotten along with for thousands of years, <laughs> never gotten along with. Um, it's, it's a huge undertaking and a huge ask. And the Europeans and the Americans didn't do the Africans any favor um, because what happens is when the Africans gain this independence, okay, well, we've gotten rid of our European overlords, but now what do we do? And in a lot of cases, they are still trying to figure out what to do, which is why we see so much conflict still in Africa, which is why we see um, development and modernization and industrialization sort of lagging or lacking in Africa because in a lot of cases, one group of, of citizens of Nigeria can't even talk to another group of citizens of Nigeria because they speak different languages. Um, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking. And unfortunately, a lot of what we see them struggling with is directly tied to what happens in the Berlin Conference. Um, and also a really good example of why imperialism can be so dangerous because um, it's not, it's, it's never going to end well when you have a usurping government come in, take control over an indigenous population, take their power from them, take their control from them, take their autonomy and their sovereignty from them, rule the way that they want to without any regard for the indigenous population's needs or wants or beliefs or, or goals, and then leave and leave them to their own devices, lead them to figure it out for themselves. Oh, and by the way, we've also taken all of your worst enemies and put you all in the same country, so good luck with that. Okay, that is where we're looking. That is why things are so tricky and so complicated and so difficult over much of the continent of Africa right now. Okay, um, that's where we're gonna end for today. That's probably a lot longer than I intended apparently I just really like to hear myself talk. So, um, please, please, please. Um, if you have any questions or if you want more discussion or more deeper understanding or things don't make sense, let me know. Um, shoot me an email or ask a question in class on Thursday and we will go from there. Thanks guys.